Well, a very special welcome to what is the first, the inaugural episode of the Impact Unlimited podcast. I'm so honored that you joined me on the show today, and I'm so excited for you to hear the content that we have for you. We're pulling out all of the stops, and we're launching big today. I'm interviewing Kevin Byrne. Kevin is the founder of Checker Trade, one of the UK's leading companies. He founded it in the midst of crisis. It's an incredible story. I know you're going to love it as we dive into some deep stuff about you as an entrepreneur, how you can grow, and how that growth in you is going to allow you to build companies and businesses that impact the world and solve people's problems. It's going to be a good one. Let's dive right into it. Hey, what's up? And welcome to another episode of the Impact Unlimited podcast. This is the show where I sit down and interview industry leading experts with an aim to equip you with both the skill sets and the mindsets to become an impactful entrepreneur. So if you want to become a better leader, build bigger businesses, get more done in less time and create an impact in the world, then look no further and let's get started. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show today, Kevin. Such an uh, such an honour to have you on. And um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, like I say, real privilege. Really appreciate you taking the time to come on. Um, for the, the audience that might not know you yet, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Ben, hey, it's an honour for me. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to tell a little bit of my story. And hopefully, there's a few nuggets there for people. Who knows? Absolutely. I'm uh, sure. My story. Um, I was uh, um, I was born to mum and dad, of course, but as, a, as an individual, I was actually a, uh, a real big surprise. My mum had three kids uh, very quickly. She had a collapse whim and had some surgery and was told she can't have children. Wow. And nine years later, she goes to the doctor with a bum, not knowing what it was. It was me. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. So I, I, I grew up in the, in the Far East, in the Middle East. My dad was a policeman in the RAF. Um, he retired through ill health when I was quite young. I think it was about, I was probably about 10. Um, and uh, moved back to the UK. And um, from there, I found it really, really difficult as an individual to cope. Um, my dad at uh, a young age, I think again, I was about 10 at the time, had a, an operation. And um, sadly, the anaesthetist put him into a coma. Um, and we were told that he might not come out. If he did, he'd be a vegetable. He did come out. He wasn't a vegetable, but uh, he lost 20 years of his memory. So I lost my dad when I was 10, wow. um, which was really, really tough. Mm. Um, and then I lost him again through, uh, through death uh, when I was 20. But wow. um, didn't really have a very good education. Um, really struggled at school. I was, I was one of those guys, Ben, and I'm sure everybody would recognize this, one of those guys that, uh, or young lads that was dragged to the school gate by their mum, yeah. screaming, I don't want to go, being passed over to a teacher. Yeah. That was me. Uh, and I hid behind my mum, basically, up until I was about 18, 19, 20 even. Wow. Um, very shy, very insecure. Wow. Um, Fair to say you've had some uh, challenges then. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hey, it's just my story. I'm, I'm sure other people will have uh, equal or even greater challenges that I've had. Sure. But um, I had no education. I had no choice at the age of 16 but to try and get a job. Mm. I did. I, I, I got a job locally in a newspaper. Um, and um, that brought me out of my shell a little bit. Yeah. But it also led me down the route of drugs as well. Wow. You know, we're all lemmings to a certain degree. Um, who's the head lemming in your life? If he's a good guy, you'll probably be all right. If he's a bad guy, you probably won't do quite so well. Sure. And I ended up, ended up on drugs and all sorts of stuff. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was a bad, bad period, bad two or three years. Yeah. Um, and then you, um, how long ago was it? Well, obviously the main topic of our conversation today is going to be this incredible company that you built and, you know, dig into sort of the lessons from that, but, um, you know, obviously uh, a tumultuous kind of upbringing and then uh, just talk to me about when you actually started your business. Cause that was similarly, it was a, it was a challenging time, right? It was a challenging time. Um, I don't think it was challenging for the nation. It was more challenging for the community that I was in. Sure. And there was a real reason why I wanted to do it. But the reason why I've told you a little bit about my start is 
you don't have to have degrees to right. be successful. You don't have to have a great education. You don't have to have an A-level in this. You don't have to go to business school. Um, mm. I didn't do any of that. Mm. Um, so whoever's listening to that and is thinking, oh, well, Kev's had this, Kev's had that, and he's done this. No, <laughs> I just had an idea and a passion. But this, yeah. is, this is basically how, how the company started. Um, it was way, way back before the internet. There was a time before the internet. <laughs> Really? <laughs> um, it was 1998. Okay. And, and I was about 35, I suppose. Um, just, or perhaps just, just n nearly 36. So, I, I, you know, at that point, I'd been bumping along the bottom of life. Sure. For sure. Mm. You know, hand to mouth, you know, um, never really having a holiday, you know, going out for a meal. You know, that, 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 just, that just couldn't happen. Wow. And I've got young, young kids around my feet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I always, has, I always had this philosophy of you've got to work hard sure. and you've got to do the best you, you possibly could. But at that point, nothing had really gelled for me. Yeah. And you'd think 35, that's a bit old to start a company, maybe. Don't know. Anyway, I, um, I'm, I'm living on the south coast of England. I'm living in this fishing village called Selsey Bill. And there's only one road in and there's only one road out. And um, I think it was around about the 7th or the 8th of January. There's a tornado. It wasn't the great storm that everybody remembers roughly around about that time. It, it was a very isolated tornado in Selsey. It touched down. It carved about a quarter of a mile of de devastation. And then it rose. Wow. And it caused about 10 million pounds worth of property damage. So uh, because that's quite rare, it ended up on the nine o'clock news, the 10 o'clock news. And over the next two or three days, white vans started to appear. And there was, there was Scouses, um, there was Irish accents, there was Liverpoolian accents, Scouses, and, and there was Geordies, and there was every accent you could possibly think of from some of these guys just knocking on people's doors. Wow. And basically people that were victims of the weather were now being victims of these road trades. Right. Uh, a typical example would be someone knocks on your door, you've got a hole in your roof, um, and they'll say, we'll help you. And they'll put a tarpaulin out, we'll keep the water out, missus. Thank you. Oh, and the local building merchants will only take cash because of the influx of, you know, trade. So that's £600 worth of materials. Um, so they'll hand over 600 quid, uh, never to be seen again. Wow. Um, and of course, people were just being ripped off by overcharging. Mm. But my dad, before he died, and after he left the military, was a, a trading standards officer. So I grew up with that kind of feel as well. A policeman, mm. trading standards officer. So you can imagine my life was, don't steer. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, he used to come home with all these types of stories about double glazers and all that kind of stuff. And, and now, I, now I'm hearing about these people are being ripped off in their own homes. And I, I couldn't understand then, and I still don't understand it now, because although there are things to safeguard people a lot more than there were 20 odd years ago, it's still happening yeah. today. I yeah. can go into Stainsbury's, walk away with a bottle of wine, unpaid for, and get arrested. I can go into someone's house, I can take a deposit, wreck their house, uh, never to be seen again, and get away with it. Mm. Yeah, so it's obviously a, a massive motivation for you was, was helping those people and, you know, meeting the community. It's not all it was. It, I, I had a family to feed. Sure. Um, and I've always wanted to make a difference. And I was sort of bouncing along, cleaning carpets, working behind bars. I had a window cleaning round. Uh, I was doing freelance graphic design. I was doing everything that I possibly could to try and feed my family. Yeah. So, you know, that has to be a big motivation to any, any guy with a young family. Well, I've got to feed my family. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, we talk about impact and making an impact. And often I say, you know, sometimes the biggest impact you can make is, is in raising healthy kids, is in having a strong family. You know, it doesn't have to be a global monstrosity of a business. You know, it can be, you know, just that first business of 
keeping your house in order, can't it? So no, it's good, good to hear. Um, but it's, um, it's interesting because your journey, what you're talking about there, I think would resonate with so many people, you know, trying this, trying that, doing something here and there. But obviously it was this business that really then began to take off. Um, you know, uh, so tell us a little bit about when you really start to realize that this was a business that had some legs in it. Wow. Uh, it was quite some years. Okay. Um, I've got a good friend of mine that even after running this for, for several years, probably four years, he came to me and he says, Kev, can I speak into your life? Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> yeah, go on then. <laughs> um, you're miserable. Your wife's miserable. You don't have a family. Kev, go and get a proper job. You're flogging a dead horse. Wow. And that was like, wow. He's right. I am miserable. My wife is miserable. We don't have family holidays, just can't afford it. I'm working all the hours God sends. And this, what's there's something missing here? Mm. Because I'm not making it successful. And, and even at that point, I've gone through quite some turbulent elements within the business that I, you know, I, I didn't know the difference in VAT between cash and accrual. Basic stuff when yeah. you're running business, and that nearly put me out of business. Um, my first business partner, I, 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 I was drawn to them because they were very successful, but they were very worldly. Mm. Good people, but very worldly. And, and in the end, I knew that I couldn't work with them because I just felt I'd unequally yoked myself with them. Sure. So I'd actually, I actually said, look, this is not working. You can have the business and I'll start again. Wow. After three years, I gave the business away to them um, and started again down, you know, where I am down, down south. And, and I renamed it Checker Trade at that point. Um, so, I'm, I, you know, some really, really tough times and, and really searching about is this, is, is this really going to work? But I knew instinctively it was an issue. And I knew instinctively that this, is, this, this was a problem in the UK mm. that needed to be solved. Mm. Mm. And that's and, it. It's a problem that needs solving. That's the, yeah, massive. Yeah. And, and the bigger the problem you can solve, the more successful you will be in monetary terms. Mm. Mm. Just monetary terms. It, and it's, I think it's going to be so encouraging for so many people to hear because it's easy for me and other people to sit back and, you know, Checker Trade is a, is a, is a national name now. It's like I listen to talk sport radio some of the time and I listen to, you know, you hear the jingle on the radio all the time and it's, it's so synonymous with, you know, the industry. And so it's easy for us to sit here and think, wow, what a success. Um, Kevin Byrne built this company. What a success he is, but not realize those, you know, you mentioned four years at the start and I'm sure there's many challenges that we can get into beyond that. People don't see the story do they they see the end product and they think oh it must be easy for you but easy. so many challenges yeah. the amount of people that come to me says oh i had that idea before you did <laughs> why, why did you do it yeah, but there yeah. was there was there was uh, quite a few defining moments that changed me sure. and and I, and I say that purposely changed me Definitely. I think it's so right what you're talking about, how, you know, the business can only grow as, as big as we grow. Talk to us about, you know, as the, as the business was scaling, what were some of the challenges maybe with people or with structure of the business? Some, um, some things there that really began to, as well as growing yourself, how did you grow the business side of it as well alongside that? Naively. <laughs> like all of us, I think, yeah. Naively. And, and dealing with, with every situation that, that, that confronts you as you go through your business. But I, I, I you know, I, I, I talk on this quite a lot, not recently, um, but I, in the past I've talked on this, this quite a lot. I think there are certain aspects within business which are fundamental. And these are not things that I've read in books. These are things that I've, I've come to understand. I'll, 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 I'll give you a very brief il illustration. Sure. Imagine you've got a successful company um, in one hand, but in the other hand, the team are becoming more and more devoted. Um, um, I've forgotten the word now, demotivated, that's the word. And they're seeing new things put into place which don't really fit what they've always believed in. Sure. And, uh, uh, and their working environment is degrading 
what's going to happen to this great product over a period of, period of time if this team are demotivated and going downhill? What's going to happen to this product? It's going to, it's going to come down. So let's turn the table. Let's imagine there's this mediocre product or service, but the team are really motivated. Right. Um, they're appreciated by their, by their employees, by their boss. There's integrity in that business now. They're being understood. There's fantastic vision and they're trusted. What's going to happen to this service or product over a period of time? It's going to... Right, yeah. So sure. what's more important today? What's more important? Is it the product and the service or is it the team? It's the team. So that was a big so focus. Many people focus on the product and the service disproportionately. To, sure. Of course, the product and service, and service is important, but if you ain't got a great team, you ain't got nothing. Right. So, so I, I'm, I understand very clearly today that people need certain things, and I'm not talking about business-wise. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about between nine to five. I'm talking about in their life. Sure. People need appreciation. Yeah. So I put a lot, a lot of effort, um, even before I realized what I was doing, I was doing it anyway. I, I really appreciate people. You know, when I, when I used to work for Celsi Press many, many years ago, you know, when I, when I came back to Celsi when I was about 20, I worked for a company for 12 years. And I used to look at the boss there and I used to think, I'm treading water. But, you, you know, I'm building your dream. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I'm not building my dream. I'm building your dream. And I never forgot that. So whenever anybody worked for me, I, I used to spend some time with them individually. And I used to look them in the eye and I used to say, thank you for giving me a slice of your life. Wow. You know, thank you. You're, bu you're building my dream right now. Um, yeah. Uh, you're probably treading water. So I want to thank you for doing that for me. And one day, if you get to a point where you want to build your own dream, come and talk to me. Sure. And if I can help you, I will. Hey, quick little break in the show, just to let you know about a wealth of free resources we've got for you. If you want to develop the skill sets and the mindsets of a successful entrepreneur, we're here to help you do exactly that. You can find a range of free courses on topics such as how to start a business, brand building, marketing, building online courses, and much more. Just head to impactunlimited.com slash training. That's impactunltd.com slash training in order to access this resource. We're regularly adding new training, so keep your eyes on our website and on your inbox. We'd love to help you on the journey. All right, back to the show. Yeah, no, I think that shows a, shows a level of security in you that you're willing to have those open conversations because I think a lot of people would just try and push that issue away, you know, and not even talk about it. So I, I, I could talk on half an hour on each of these subjects, but appreciate is a big thing in people's life. Integrity yeah. levels is a big thing in people's life. I used, to sell to, I used to say to my sales team, if you exaggerate, if you lie, if you manipulate, if, if, you're, if you're a woman and you're talking to a male tradesman, I don't want any sexual in innuendos or any, anything kind of seductive going on here. If sure. we cannot survive by telling people the truth, we don't deserve to be in business. Wow. I used to say, I used to say to my customer support team, if you've got a complaint from a tradesman, gauge the truth the best you can, put yourself in their shoes, and if you think that we've done a bad job and they need to have their money back, I'm empowering you to give them their money back. Mm me I'm, I'm just someone on the phone no i'm empowering you to do it and no one's going to tell you off if you do amazing so you're building a level of integrity which is ticked mm. being understood in people's life is massive most people even right now have got something going on with a colleague with a friend with a relative where you're feeling there's a dispute and you're not being understood yeah Everyone's for sure yeah for sure if you if, if so if, if there's something going on in your company if you can take that person to one side and just say look you're not firing on all, all cylinders at the moment is there something i've done to upset you and then shut up mm. it will start to come out 
Yeah. I mean, I've, I've learned some very, very, very good things, very good techniques. I mean, I, mean, I, I hate the word technique, but I suppose in this occasion, you can use it. You listen to what people are saying to you. And if you keep quiet, they'll start talking. And when, and you try and empathize the best you possibly, you try and put yourself in that person's shit the best you possibly can. Someone could be saying, oh, Kev, you did this and then you did that. And you might want to scream at them. No, I didn't. <laughs> you don't do that. You listen and you take no and you nod. And then once they've finished, you repeat back to them right. what they believe has happened. You don't say, no, you were wrong. You repeat back, sure. even if you want to scream at them. <laughs> and you know what? Once they feel understood, their whole demeanor will be, oh, sure. he understands. Yeah, yeah. Now, unless they're a Jeremy Kyle type of person, they'll be much more likely to listen to your point of view once they feel they've been empathized with and understood. Very and, true. It, and it just yeah. solves so many issues. The, the fourth thing I talk about a lot is vision. Sure. And another word for vision is expectation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's huge. It's huge in people's lives. And at first you don't get it. But here's a very, very simple an, 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 an analogy. Ben, in the next 12 months, providing the lockdown disappears, in the next 12 months, are you planning on having some kind of break with your family? I hope so, yeah. Yeah. Well, guess what? Uh, you and the rest of the world that have said yes, uh, they'll be looking on the internet. They'll be looking at the budget. What can we afford, what we can't afford? Do we need warm clothes? Do we need clo cold clothes? You'll be planning it and your actions and your behaviors will flow to make it happen yeah now tim peak uh famous astronaut in chichester just up the road from me uh, and um are you planning on going into space next year i hadn't planned on it guess what you're not looking at spacesuits on the internet that's true that's very true the effects of weightlessness on your body yeah you're not budgeting for mm. it why haven't planned on you're it, not yeah. expecting it to happen mm. no you're not expecting it there's a big difference between that would be nice if someone's someone's often said to me sorry i'll rephrase that i've often used this example kev um are you going on safari well i hope to one day guess what i'm not planning it yeah i'm not planning it if someone said to me, Kev, are you, uh, I, 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 are you going to take checker trade into the Northeast? Absolutely. I'm expecting it to happen. So sure. my actions and my behaviors will flow to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. So my challenge to everyone that might listen to this is, what are you expecting to happen? I know these are difficult times to, to use those things. Mm -hmm. but what are you expecting to happen in the next six months to 12 months? And you, guess what? Your actions and your behaviors will flow to make it happen. And when I learned that, I'm thinking, well, what am I expecting? I've, I've got this pokey little business, which is employing two or three people down on the South Coast. I've already given it away once. I'm starting to try and build it again. I'm bouncing along the bottom of life. What am I expecting? <sighs> okay, go and get pictures to reflect what you want. You've got to change from where you are to where you Absolutely. want to expect. Yeah. Okay, uh, wouldn't it be great, I wasn't expecting it, but wouldn't it be great to be national? So I went out and bought some big pictures of, of, of the UK and working in one room. It was a shed at the bottom of my garden. <laughs> so I put, I put a, a picture on, on all the four walls of the UK and I wrote above it, I'm national. You won't believe it at first, but if you keep looking at it and you keep declaring it and, and, you, and you keep that dominant image before you, you will start to move towards the most dominant image you allow to reside in your head. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going in there, I'm going to be national. Am I? No, it's flipping rubbish. Anyway, after a period of time of, of writing it down, um, 
And looking at it consistently, you start to think, well, if I am going to be a national, what do I need to do? And slowly but surely, your expectation starts to build. And as your expectation builds, your actions, your behaviors start to flow to make it happen. Mm-hmm. It's really simple stuff. But whoever's listening to this, 98% of them won't do it. Sure. That's but the reality. If they do, it will change their life. Yeah. No, it absolutely. Will change their life. I've always uh, liked the the quote that says, you know, that dreams, you know, your dreams will conform to your reality, but vision makes reality conform to it. You know, if you just have a dream, I'd like to do that one day. It's never going to happen. But if you have a vision, it it forces your reality to conform to it because it's, it's red hot inside of you and it changes the way you live and act. You know, it's clear from me just in this short time, you know, digging into it with you that what a lot of people see as the keys to business success they get in the weeds. They look at the strategies that are here today, gone tomorrow. But everything you're talking about is is top level stuff. It's you. It's your vision. It's your values. All of this kind of stuff. And you know, these are the keys to success, or they've at least been the keys to your success. That's for sure. Oh, let let let, let me go back to appreciation, integrity, understanding, and vision. Uh, there's a fifth one, which is called trust. Sure. Trust people. Give them a job. Ask ask them to take some time out. Ask them, what are your ideas on improving this? Mm, so important. You know, yeah. take, take some time out because you've, probably, you've been doing this job for eight months now, two years now. You must have means and ways on this could be done better. Mm. You know, take, take, take some, some time out and I, I really want to hear that. Mm. Um, but then yeah. if, you, if, you, if you say that, then you've got to, you've got to go with what they say. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but then they'll own it. Yeah, for sure. You know? Yeah. And I know that's one of my challenges is having that trust to be able to think, okay, you know, you can do this as good as me. Not that I do anything amazing, but you know, that, that sense of this my baby, as you mentioned, and then handing that over to someone, that's a challenge, right? I've I've been shocked that I found that most people could do things better than I can. (laughs) (laughs) That's the truth. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. So so if I could just crystallize that, Mm. those five things, if you've got, appreciation at work, integrity at work, under, you're being understood at work, you've got vision at work, and you've got trust at work, but you haven't got those things at home, mm. where are you going to want to be? Mm, at sure. work or at home? Yeah. You're going to want to be at work. Mm. And people become passionate. Um, and, you know... I've often said this, my, my team would have walked over hot coals for me. Yeah. Why? Because I'd have walked over hot coals for them and they know it. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Um, and when you've got a team like that behind you, this mediocre product or this, or this mediocre service is going gonna, is gonna to go national. It will. Yeah. 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 Um, but the biggest one of all of those is the vision. You've got to get the vision into you as the business leader. If you haven't got it in you, how's it going to get into your team? Good, yeah. I had to convince myself, get myself to an expectation that we're going to be national. And once it's a genuine expectation, it just flows out of you. Mm. It just flows out of you into your top team, into all of those that are on the cold face doing all the hard, you know, the hard work. Yeah, Um, that's good. The vision is huge within people. Without vision, people get sick. Yeah. Uh, if and you've got vision, they're motivated. They feel they're, they're part of something that's important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, you know, obviously that vision has produced, you know, in your life, something that's, you know, like I said before, a, a national scale and, um, you know, just obviously conscious of time and, and wrapping up yeah. in a few moments. But um, we just would love to hear, you know, towards maybe the end of that journey for you, um, you know, because it's a fascinating story and there were so many challenges and you've built this incredible business. But, you know, just a couple of years ago, you actually sold the business. And so um, just yeah. love to hear in, you know, as we sort of close out just some thoughts around that like um you know maybe what um you know anything specific you did to prepare the company for exit the emotions involved in selling a business you know talk us through that because i know there'd be a lot of entrepreneurs listening and their dream would be i'd love to sell a business and you've done that um, but it may not be as uh, as they expect it to be the whole experience i think i should write a book on the emotions (laughs) i was as i was asking that question i'm thinking this could be five more podcasts right (laughs) 
Yeah, I never wanted to sell the business initially. Sure. Um, I I had a, a couple of business partners, my brother, and I've already mentioned Richard. Uh, my brother's 10 years older than me, and Richard, I think, is about eight years older. And I certainly am not putting the blame on them in any way, shape, or form. This is something that I, I allowed myself to feel. They didn't put this feeling on me. Mm. Uh, I just want to make that clear, because I don't want people to think I'm blaming anyone. Um, but they're older. Uh, and when we had shareholders meetings, uh, they sound posh, but we never, they weren't posh, really. Um, even when we were a national brand, I didn't have a board. I, I had nothing. It was just me making decisions with my team. Sure. But as they were shareholders, we used to meet up once a year. And, and the topic used to come up. It wasn't laboured on, but it's Kev, you know, when are we, how are we going to realise some money from this? And that, I, I, I allowed that to take control of me. I, I, a fault that I've got, if it is a fault, is I want to put people first. Sure. But that, to my own... Um, deprement um, and I'm thinking well okay how how can I achieve that but we were approached by uh, a national brand this is about four years before I sold this national brand everyone would know its name sure huge brand um, and I won't I won't give the name because I've been threatened to be sued uh, if, if I voice it out publicly but they, they, they came to me, they wanted to partner with me, and it was like, wow, this national brand want to partner with me? Um, so we had some meetings, and at the end of one of the meetings, they said, oh, if we're going to partner with you, how about, if, would you be open if we could sell a few percentage to us? I said, well, look, I'm not interested, but I've got two partners that want to retire. Sure. So I approached them, and they said, yes, Kev, that would be great. So um, it ended up the the their 40% was being sold. And I was going to be left with 60%, which was great. Uh, and then they said, well, no, I actually care. We want all the business. I said, well, I told you at the beginning, I'm not interested. Yeah, but look what you could achieve. You wanted to solve the road trade problem. Don't you think with our brand, with you at the helm still, you could solve this business, you could solve it all. And I said, yeah, okay, I think I could. And, and, they, and they gave me a very attractive exit package over a three-year period as well so I said yes they didn't keep their word they um, they uh, continued to have meetings with us extracting as much information as they possibly can I'm saying look where's the legals in this oh it's coming Kev it's coming the legals finally came and they weren't what we agreed on right. so I told them to take a hike but that set the, that set that uh, that whole roller coaster of sending the company into place. Now I've got two business partners that thought they were going to walk away with a lot of money, and now they're not. Sure. They weren't particularly that interested in keeping the business, but for me, it was my baby, and I, and I wanted certain things in place. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm now thinking, oh, I've got to sell it for the sake of my business partners. It's not that they put that on me, I allowed that to come upon me myself. Yeah. So I, I, I took someone on board that helped me tremendously. Uh, his name's Rupert Warcliffe. Tremendous guy. If anybody ever is thinking of selling their business, they need to talk to Rupert. Um, I'm sure they can get hold of me one way or another through Facebook. I can introduce you to him. Yeah. Um, he says, Kev, this is what you need to put in place. This is need, how you need to present your company. Fortunately, uh, I'd, I'd learned through Bob Harrison many years before, employ people more intelligent than you. And, that's, and I took that on board. So I had, I had a really good team that had built a really good foundation to the company. And there really wasn't a great deal more that I had to do to make it attractive. You know, we were profitable. We had, we had great historical data and projections. And we could, we could uh, you know, our, our company handbook was done by a, a, an incredible HR lady uh, for us. Uh, she started her own business now called, called um, star people i believe um so i had all that in place um but I, from that point I, I was i was pitching to pe houses to on to other entrepreneurs with money uh, um to uh, big corporate companies and 
I just said, no, no. People were putting huge amounts of sums on the table and I'm going, no, no. Um, and then uh, an American company approached me um, and I said to them, look, I want this, 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 this in place. And if you can't say yes to all of those, go away. And they said, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Wow, uh, and one of them was looking after my team. Sure, and we spent nine months of due diligence, and there was slowly ticking off all the boxes. Looking after my team. Look, we need to address that. And in the end, they said, "Kev, we can't put that into the contract." I said, "Well, it's finished then." Wow, wow. I said, "Well, well Kev, we we we're, we're putting lottery size euro lottery size money on the table." You can't say no. That's what I am. You, if you can't put that into some form of contract in any way, shape, or form, the deal's finished. Wow. Uh, and, I, and I walked away from that deal. Um, that was in, the stress when you're saying no to a, to a Euro lottery winning is just incredible. But they wouldn't look after my team. But what I love about that. What I love about that, Kevin, is they said you can't say no, you know, as if you have to say yes to the money, but to you, there was something more important than the money. Yeah, my team were more important. Which is, yeah, amazing. So I said no. And that point, I'm going, I am just, I said, I'm sorry, business partners. <laughs> they, again, they weren't handing me for this. This was all <laughs> me. Yeah. Sorry, business partners. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. Maybe I can get something in place which, which you can we can buy your shares out over a period of time. Yeah. And one of them took that and the other one didn't. Sure. So um, then I got contacted by another company. Um, and again, I'm going, oh, I've just had enough of this. And oh, no, I'm not interested. Um, and and a, a, again, uh, Rupert said to me, well, why, why don't you put the big questions to them, Kev, and, uh, and, and put some conditions in place as well. So I did. And they said, yes, 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 yes. And um, it's, that's history. The mm. deal went through. Today, I wish I hadn't done it. Right. Um, someone said to me a long time ago, they, they said, Kev, why would you want to sell your business if it's successful and it's fulfilling lots of things in your life? And, and I look at that now and I think, why didn't I listen to him? Mm. Why would I want to sell something that's a big part of my life, that's paying all my bills, I get a huge amount of satisfaction from, and fulfillment from and I miss it so much Ben mm, wow. I miss it so much wow. I, I, I genuinely wish I hadn't sold it um, I believe that there was things that were pushing me to sell it but they were all coming from me sure and I, and I just wish that I hadn't allowed this roller coaster to take over my thought processes and I just wish I'd taken more time out to, to go to one side and go, Kev, is this really the right thing for you, for your family? Hey, I, I'm, I'm blessed more than, more than most people in the UK. I've managed to buy all, all my kids a house. We haven't got mortgages. You know, we're, we're blessed financially like you wouldn't believe. And this is really, really corny. And so many people will, will just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's really not about the money. Life is not yeah. about the money. It's about having a good marriage. It's about having healthy kids. It's about having health throughout. Mm. It's, it's about having that appreciation, integrity, being understood, that vision and that trust all ticked. Mm. Doesn't matter how much money you've got. If those things aren't ticked, you're miserable. Mm. So true. Really yeah. Right now. I'm a bit miserable to a degree because the vision's gone. It's, it's just, uh. yeah. And I think that's such an interesting thing for entrepreneurs to understand and realize. Cause as we've mentioned already on the show, it's, it's people have this ideal, this dream, this idea of what selling a business would look like um, and, and how much purpose money could create in their life, but money isn't going to create that purpose in your life. So it's, mm -hmm. Really good to hear you. Obviously, someone who's walked that journey really say that quite clearly. Yeah. Mm. If, if you, I, I would say to someone, really question yourself as to why you're building a business. Very good. If it's just for money, if it's just for the luxuries of this life, you have to understand that once you get to that point, 
they won't mean anywhere as near mm. to you as what mm. you thought they would. Yeah, yeah. Nowhere near. Yeah. I, yeah, can, I, I can go all over the world by whatever I want. But the thing I want most is a great relationship with my wife and kids. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. It's so true. I mean, even as, as trivial as, you know, you get the new phone or new car and it's like exciting for, you know, a few days, but then it's just normal, you know, it just gets, it just becomes a normal and there's, there's something more that needs to drive us all. And, and so, yeah, that's what I've absolutely loved about hearing from you. And, and I think that's obviously a massive key to why you have been successful because you've built something that's lasted over time because it's not just been based on, you know, tactics that change and, you know, getting one up on anybody, but it's about being consistent, having values and, um, um, listen, I, I really appreciate everything that you've shared with us today, Kevin. It's um, yeah, it's an honour to have you on. Um, yeah, is there anything else that you'd like to sort of say to the audience before we finish? Um, I would probably say uh, people would say to me, Kevin, what's the number one thing in building a business? I'd say people and vision. Right. Those two things. Right. Look after your people. Make sure you've got a vision. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think you've embodied that in everything you've said today. So yeah, like I say, we, uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much for coming on. Ben, it's been a great pleasure. And I hope hopeful people listen to this and they've taken a few bits from it. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure there were lots of actionable stuff to take away for sure. Thank you so much. Yes. Hey, well, thanks so much for being with us on the impact unlimited podcast today. If the content has helped you in any way, please reach out. We would love to hear from you tag us on the socials if anything has inspired you from this episode and listen if you've got two minutes to spare we'd love it if you'd leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform honestly we'd be forever grateful and to show that when you do be sure to enter our monthly appreciation prize draw where we give away amazon vouchers to our podcast community simply head to impactunlimited.com slash podcast that's impact unlimited unltd.com slash podcast in order to find out all the information as well as explore more free training content listen it's been a pleasure and remember don't just make an income make an impact all right we'll see you next week